with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash too many captains productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox, and I'm Ashley Chancellor, and this is the anniversary episode of Collateral Cinema. Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, it's our meek anniversary episode. meek anniversary. Yeah, and we are a 420-friendly podcast, so whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, or joints, smoke it if you've got it. So yeah... We've been doing this for a little while now, haven't we, Ash? Yeah, I guess this is uh, this is the season five. Season five, yeah. So this is our fourth anniversary. It should be about fourth, fourth or fifth anniversary, give or take. You know, I mean, technically, I guess you could say fifth because the original pilot episode audition That's true that was recorded in 2017. So. If you really want to split hairs here, we could say that we're uh, like five years old. So you could, you could, but we, we're actually saving the the grand five year celebration for next season. Yeah, that, that's going to episode. Yeah, that one's going to be interesting because we're going to do a recap of audition. And that same month, we're just going to go ahead and make it a meek anniversary month. We're going to be doing Ace Attorney. Ace Attorney, exactly. As a collabo between Collateral Gaming and Collateral Cinema. Yeah, so l- just a little sneak peek of what's happening next season, something we already have planned in the works. Yeah, that's it's going to be really interesting, to to, to say the least. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> but this movie right here, I'm going to go ahead and grab it from my DVD rack. This is not so much a movie, but an episode of an anthology series, right? Yeah, so this is kind of something new for the podcast, something we haven't really done yet is is an episode. I'm, I'm even trying to tr- figure out the way that I'm going to like format the episode title when I publish it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like imprint comma masters of horror imprint parentheses masters. No, of horror. I, I, I would, <laughs> I would just say Takashi Miike's imprint. I mean, even here on the DVD case, it doesn't really have a uh, masters of horror logo on it. Anywhere, it's true. Really. It's true. Except for maybe the spine. But, I mean, you wouldn't really think that this was an episode of a TV series if you saw this DVD. No. I I mean, I I have the original uh, Anchor Bay release right here. And Masters of Horror itself was quite interesting. That was, it was originally envisioned by Mick Garris. And he uh, decided that he wanted to get, like, either some up-and-coming directors and uh, some old-school directors. Actually, he, he got both of them together and just gave them free reign, except for, you know, like, nudity or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they couldn't do, like, full frontal nudity for some reason, even though this was on Showtime. It's, it's like, c- come on, man. It was like, after yeah. hours, bro. Come on, we, we, had an, we had an episode about it. We had an episode of the director's cut about this shit. TV so. was just not ready. And, and that's what's crazy to me is he was told, you know, do whatever. And so he did whatever in true Miike fashion. And I guess it was just too much. It was the only episode from that entire anthology series that was banned. It was straight up banned from broadcast. It's yeah. crazy on cable of all things. This was too much for fucking Showtime. 
I mean, <laughs> Showtime, other than Cinemax, they were notorious for all the Skinemax shit. It's like, I mean, my God, okay, so all the softcore titty porn, okay, that's okay, but no, I mean, this right here is really no worse than Hostel. No, I mean, it's I not mean, necessarily gory. Uh, it's not sexual. It's not even violent, I would say, unlike the Oscars were this year. Oh, yeah, that was very violent. <laughs> I'm, I'm, st- I, I'm like both traumatized and bored by it by now. <laughs> it, it's a weird mixture of both. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's the most we can say about There's it. There's a website. How fast can you sleep? How fast can he smack Chris.com or something to oh, that effect? No, really? Did and somebody... it's actually, it's hilarious. Oh, you can actually no. fucking like smack Chris and it, and you can do it in, in, in freedom units or glorious metric. Oh, wow. That, I mean, the fucking internet. I swear to God. Slapchris.com. That's what oh, it is. Oh, no. Are you really going to slap Chris? We're going to do it in freedom units. We're going to do it in freedom units. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, oh, no. Yeah, we're. Wa- I'm watching a demonstration of this fucking website now. It's like, goddamn it! How do we go from imprint Takashi Miike to fucking Will Smith and Chris Rock? How the fuck, man? <laughs> okay, I knew it had. I had. To, I had to slip it in there. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, only thing I'm going to say is that it's fucking stupid bullshit. Who fucking cares? It's like, I mean, okay, well, I guess Will Smith is not nearly as cool as we thought he was. I don't know. Whatever. But yeah. anyway, back to Takashi Miike's imprint. See, see, look, that shit's even overshadowing, overshadowing Takashi Miike now. What the fuck, dude? We can't let it do that. No more, uh, no more talk, on, no about, more talk that. about that. Yeah, back to what is arguably one of Takashi Miike's most beautiful movies, this side of... Uh, Sukiyaki Western Django. Hey, happy April Fool's Day, Bo. Is it April Fool's now? Officially. Oh, shit. April Fool's Day. Wow, this is an auspicious occasion. We are recording (laughs) our anniversary episode on fucking April Fool's Day, and we didn't even think to do April Fool's Day, the fucking slasher movie. We're so we're so uh what, what's we're the word behind we're the so schedule. behind yeah like we're doing our fucking our fucking anniversary episode in April yeah what the fuck man we're oh, we're, well. we're out of it <laughs> oh fucking well well back to imprint it's a very interesting story in of a in and of its own right I I believe that it the author of the original story it, it's based on old you know Japanese folklore you know there's lots of ghost stories that you know. Jap- is in Japanese folklore and everything. Uh-huh. And it was actually the same author, I believe, who made the original audition novel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she actually makes, I believe she makes an appearance in this movie. She's the torturer in this movie. Damn. Yeah, she, the, the crazy bitch that just comes out of nowhere and is just like, oh, she's like ready. She, she has a smile on her face. She's like, I'm here to do some fucking damage. That's true. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to the full torture scenes here in a little bit. But yeah, that's what I was going to say. This movie's not necessarily very sexual or, or graphic. Or, yeah. or Well, it is graphic, but it's not like gory. It's not like violent. It's just, it's the torture. And I honestly, that kind of gets me more than anything else. Again, we'll get into it later, but I mean, I, I'm more squeamish about that than I am about, you know, most of the shit that we cover. And then it's that, and then also just the disturbing subject matter. Well, you see my DVD shelf right here. I have some shit right here that is some shit right here, dude, when it comes to fucked up movies. And so the torture scenes in here to me are very, they're actually very subdued in a way, you know? Yeah, but we also have aborted fetuses and you know what? Fuck them kids. (laughs) Fuck them kids, man. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm a member of the Democratic Party. I have my uh, I have my adrenochrome from the aborted fetuses. (laughs) I have it right here on my shelf. It's in a vial. Nice. I I, I got it for voting for Hillary Clinton. It It was a very, very auspicious occasion in its own right. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. No. There's no. there's aborted fetuses in this movie, and uh, the the props that they used are fucking great, actually. Oh yeah. There, there's there's actually a behind the scenes 
uh, um, featurette on this DVD. Mm-hmm. We were watching it, yeah. Yeah, and, and they actually showed how they set up one of the uh, fetuses in the movie. I mean, they of course, they started with just, it was just a mock fetus, of course, you know. And the, but, yeah. you know, they started just kind of adding, you know, all kinds of different substances and, you know, different compounds to make the blood look a little more real and to make it look like afterbirth and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know. And that was that was actually really really cool on the uh, on the visual effects uh, side of things, you know. Yeah. And and especially, but what really got to me was what was going on a lot in the background of this movie. I mean, if yes. you if you really just kind of look around, I mean, I think what's really implied is that Billy Drago's character is really kind of in the throes of a hallucination, like he is just completely freaking out there's a lot of shit going on in the background i mean i think you see the the dead ghost of his sister and of kamomo and it's like it, it, and, but they're just in the background it's it, it's actually pretty subtle and i mean uh billy drago reacts to it but yeah. you yeah. know it, it's uh it's still it, 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 it it's very visceral and i and i love that you know, you just kind of have this shit going on unfocused in the background, and that's creepy as hell. And I've well, seen that done, I guess, in other more modern horror films. Well, the thing but is, you still need to see Audition because <laughs> I see a lot of parallels in how uh, Mike approached this. That's a pretty torture-centered one, too, right? Yeah, eh, Kind of more towards the end, yeah. more or less. But what's what's notable about audition and how it kind of ties into imprint is the dreamlike state that uh, that movie starts to get in. I mean, I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but it does start to get into a little bit of a fever dream angle. And uh, Mike kind of has that in this as well. I mean, there are scenes that are kind of, you know, you have characters coming in and out, you know, like you have Billy Drago and the uh, prostitute woman going in and out of the of the scenario that this girl is talking about. And that's, that's really what's interesting about the character of the, the little pro- the prostitute girl mm-hmm. is that, you know, she's pretty much the narrative device of the entire movie. That's what yeah, she is. I agree. Yeah. Like, she's the one who really just kind of sets everything in motion here. I mean, who knows? Maybe she even fed this guy a hallucinogen and that's why he's freaking out and everything. But you know, I mean, the, the whole thing is, is that Billy Drago is going to this island be, that is it's just an island that has a brothel on it. It's just an island for whores, pimps and Johns. That's all that's that's all that's there, mm-hmm. you know, and you, you already get the you already get a fucked up tone early on when they, they're actually going to the island. I mean, there's like bloated, dead, pregnant women floating in the in the fucking water. So we already know that, yeah, there's already just death surrounding Th- that's, this that's island. That's the tone pretty early on. You, you know what's funny is uh, I haven't actually seen this movie talked about on the podcast. The only thing I could find was a, was a podcast that talked about this and paired it up with Box. Yeah, but what, what was the name of the podcast? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a, yeah, little, the, give, give, a give little shout out. Unpleasant a, Movies Podcast. The Unpleasant Movies Podcast. Yeah, I actually thought it was good. I, I I enjoyed the commentary. I only listened to a few minutes of the episode, but it's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and so, but anywho, uh, we're probably the first podcast. I mean, at least as far as Apple Podcasts goes, within the Apple Podcast app, uh, that actually has uh, that's going to talk about imprint solely. Yeah. I mean, you really see this movie on a lot of uh, disturbing movie lists and icebergs. Mm-hmm. But actually, I don't think I've really seen it on a whole lot of icebergs, honestly. I've, I've seen it more on, like, uh, you know, like horrible reviews. He has his most disturbing list. It would he's, fit on icebergs, though. It, it would. I mean, he, he's uh, featured this. I think uh, Nick's Fears, uh, she's uh, talked about this movie before. And th- there's a few other reviews if you actually go on YouTube and look for it. But, yeah, there's just not a lot of people who talk about this. And it's a damn shame because, like I said earlier, this has a color palette that's not unlike his movie Sukiyaki Western Django, which is this kind of weird fever dream mixture of Chanbara and Spaghetti Western. Like, mm-hmm. Quentin Tarantino is in that movie randomly. 
you know? Mm, damn. It, it's, it's, a, but <laughs> it's a very colorful movie. It, it's a retelling of a uh, Shakespeare play. I forget. What, I think it was The War of the Roses, I believe. You know what's interesting about this one, actually, is that... Uh, is that it was produced for an American TV show. So all of the actors speak English, but you can tell that English isn't their native language. See, I kind of feel like that may have been kind of a mistake. I mean, I am I understand that you have to kind of Americanize this shit to a certain degree, but... They could have just gone with subtitles. They could have, and then, you know, whenever there's English-speaking parts, have the... Actors and actresses speak English, you know. But, but I don't know. Maybe Billy Drago can't speak Japanese. That would probably put a damper on well, that. Well, the, the actress obviously could fucking speak English. That doesn't matter as far as the narrative framing and everything. Like they still could have both spoke English. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, th think about that. You know. Yeah. It, it's it is just a little jarring, honestly. I mean, and it's it's a very very authentic you know setting. I mean, Mike really put a lot into the actual set pieces here but maybe that's actually realistic i mean think about it billy drago's traveling to this place and he's not speaking japanese well he's he's been to japan before i mean he he met this girl he's going there to find his lost love named komomo is Christopher and speaking Japanese in story or is he speaking English? It's not he's clear. Spe he's speaking English in story. I mean, it's it's very strange. So I then the characters are speaking English as well as they actually would. Yeah. Maybe it's intentional. I, it, it is. Inten no, it's definitely intentional. I'm just saying that I feel like there should have been certain scenes where there were mostly the Japanese actresses. Mm -hmm. They could have spoke Japanese just fine. And I think that it would have actually kind of translated a little better if they would have just went with subtitles. I mean, at least from an acting standpoint, like mm -hmm. it would have been more natural, I feel. It would have been natural for uh for Mike san and it would have been uh, natural for the actresses. As so well. like in any scene where they're not speaking to Christopher, yeah. they'd be speaking Japanese. Uh, that actually makes a lot of sense. That probably would have been better. I mean in a way you could say that the uh the prostitute girl she as a narrative device she's actually kind of there more for the American audience than for anything like mm -hmm. maybe you could s say that you know that's kind of like a Mike trying to you know translate his words to an um, English audience you know Billy Drago being the English audience yeah maybe you yeah. can kind of see it like that a little bit I guess that's why he's there you know it seems like he he wanted to use this location and these actors not even necessarily these specific actors but people you know that that fit the roles and so i you know maybe that's that's what the whole thing is and that you know in that sense that's why he had billy drago play the protagonist as the yeah the translation but like you said maybe it would have been better if those were done in japanese yeah i i, I feel like it would have led to maybe a more natural flow to the story because i mean it, it kind of feels like because you know it you have this intrinsically Japanese director, you know, trying to make this English language film. I feel that there was a lot that was kind of sort of lost in the in the mix there a little bit. Yeah, it's like you you know you can't understand the full chadness of Takashi Miike. Oh, he is a total chad. A mother motherfucker has made hundreds and hundreds of movies. He is a giga chad <laughs> of cinema. <laughs> but then again, we've watched all of Takashi Miike movies in dub. Yeah, of course. I but I've watched quite a few of them in its original uh, Japanese. Like, yeah. like audition is best viewed in its original Japanese. Honestly. Okay. But you know, on, on the other hand, you know, I do like the cheesiness of the Ichi the Killer dub. You know, since mm -hmm. it's all British people, it's it just it's just so jarring. But there, it's it kind of works in a weird way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, here it's just I, I don't know. I I, I feel like. Maybe they should have given Mike the, the the leeway to go with it with different languages because that's also kind of a trademark of his work. Mm -hmm. He is known for having different languages in his movies and as a thematic element, you know, to kind of kind of make his movies kind of speak to multiple people, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not like that would have been out of his bailiwick. Right. And that and that that's what then that, that's what to me kind of kind of breaks it down a little bit, 
You know, I still think this is a good film. You know, it's not one of Mickey's greatest works, but it's one of his most interesting ones. I agree. You know, it, it, it definitely stands out. Like if you're a fan of Mickey films, like, you know, this is, is one that, you, I mean, this is one that you have to watch. This is a must see. And the man's done uh, almost 100 or over 100 films. And he's done films ranging different genres. I mean, if you look at his filmography right now, there's a lot of kids movies that he's making nowadays. I guess I guess he's just kind of going into a different phase of his career now. I mean, and, and he's made, like, anime and manga adapt adaptations. I mean, he, he made Yatterman, for fuck's sake. He, he made a live-action version of that. Personally, I think that they fucked up uh, not giving him Shoujo Subaki. They made a live-action version of Midori Shoujo Subaki. Uh -huh. I don't think that it's made by... Uh, I don't think it's made by Mika Sama, but... Uh, 188 mean, credits on uh, IMDb. That's amazing. It's yeah. like it's like I I hope he can get to two hundred movies, man. Like so, uh, one hundred and eleven director credits specifically. Wow. Uh, man, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. The over my man's has done over a hundred films, and yeah, he's been all over the place. We've talked about that on previous Meek episodes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, horror and and torture stuff. I mean, that's just scratching the surface of his work. It's kind of interesting that, that that's mostly what we've done so far. Seems like, yeah. Well, that's because I wanted to get the really disturbing ones that everybody really knows about out of the way first, you know? Yeah, true. You know, everybody knows about that, but the sooner we get those out of the way, the sooner we can get to his more obscure works, of which I do have quite a few of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. S stuff that, you know... Maybe some that are a little more well known, like like I have Crow Zero, and I also have uh, the first Dead or Alive, which is mm -hmm. yeah he he did a, a crazy ass Yakuza movie there, and that <laughs> movie is Fuck fucking yeah. insane. I mean the the last episode we did was was that Visitor Q was that last season or was that the season before? It was Gozu. Oh, that's right. Gozu was the last one we did. Yeah, Gozu was the last one we did, and that was like his most you know fever dreamish <laughs> movie. And mm -hmm. I mean that 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 movie is his most Lynchian work. Uh, Visitor Q is the one that broke Dakota. <laughs> oh yes, it was. We we will always bring that up. We we broke Dakota with Visitor Q. <laughs> if it wasn't Visitor Q, it was going to be necromantic, probably. Yeah, that's fair. Apparently, he draws a line of corpse fucking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, we are terrible. Good old fashioned corpse fucking. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um yeah this movie doesn't have any corpse fucking but it, it does have torture it does have i'm about to describe it in graphic detail so content warning trigger warning um nails driven into the nail beds yeah into fingernails into yes. kimomo's nail beds you know just and then nails driven up into her gums prying keeping her mouth open yeah. Now, if anybody has ever had a really, really bad toothache, I mean, you would probably much rather have metal implements shoved in your gums. I mean, I I had to go through that. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, I mean, I think that that's much more preferable than a rotting jaw, practically. That's fair, but uh, it, it's it's torture whenever it's done oh, for definitely. any other reason. Yeah, and, did, and th that's honestly what I want to see more in horror movies is dental torture. More dental torture, people. Uh, find, find ways to do that. It, I mean, it made me squeamish. Oh, like, hey. like you were you were here with me. Like the, the the torture scenes were getting me. I was like, oh ah. wait, 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 dude, wait till you get to old boy. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. that's gonna be a fun movie. But yeah, they do that, and then they they drive like fucking burning sticks into her armpits, and it's just like oh yeah. Oh, and, and they hang her upside down, and she pisses herself. And she pisses on herself. It's, yeah. it's, it's insane, it's man. It's very, just very inhuman and all over a jade ring. It's just just cruelty for the sake of cruelty. Yeah, you know? yeah. But, but, I mean, the way that Takashi Miike frames it, it also has this weird quirkiness to it, you know? Like, like you have the little person who has syphilis, you know? He has uh, half his nose gone. Yeah. And he's he's like literally picking his nose apart. I know. <laughs> yeah. He's sitting like he's literally sitting there like clucking like eh, huck, huck, like like that. Uh, 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 uh. And, and and then it just cuts to him every now and again and then you just see the joy on the torturer's face like she's just having a blast doing this. Like she's relishing every moment of it. There's even a moment where she, her and the and the uh main the 
main mother of the of the house of the brothel or whatever, mm. you know, the mistress of the house. Yeah. Like they're pretty much just kind of sitting there admiring their work a little bit. You're and just like, fuck. That's the part of the story that was consistent in both versions. So in both versions of of of, uh, of her tale. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some different versions of this, you know? I mean, the, 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 the first line of bullshit that the prostitute girl gives is that, you know, uh, she met Kamomo, and Kamomo was the only one that was nice to her. Uh, somebody stole this jade ring from the headmistress of the brothel, and they accused Kamomo of it. Uh, Kamomo is tortured, like, brutally, and then uh, in a moment of desperation, she hangs herself. Yeah. So that that's the first line of of that's the first story that is spun here. So right. Yeah. And then we get into the second version of the story and her childhood's quite a bit different. Uh she's the product of an incestuous relationship. Uh she was dropped in the river as a child and was left there for a day, survived. So her mom thought, huh, I'll keep her. Her mom wasn't a, a midwife. Her mom was an abortionist. Now, 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 you see, you're actually going ahead a little bit. There's a story in between there where she kind of spins a happier, a more happier and more tragic tale, you know? like Well, that's in the first version, yeah. No, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, that's in the first version. You're right. I, I thought that there was a second part to this. There is like a second story that she spins somewhere. Well, okay. So what happens it, is no, no. What, what is it? she it's goes over the the what happened with Kamomo part first, and then she goes back and does her her childhood or yeah. something like that. I don't and then, know. And then she tells the truth as to what happened to Kamomo, and then she tells the truth of her own backstory. That I think yes. that's that's the order of stories that's. Yeah. That's brought up here. Exactly. Yeah. What you brought up is the final story. Like we're going out of order here. Yeah, we're going I'm... out of order here. Like like what is it uh. start it starts with her uh it starts with her uh, first uh, tale of what happened to Kamomo, then it goes into her first tale of what happened in her childhood, and then she tells the truth about what happened to Kamomo, and then she tells the truth about, about her, her childhood, childhood, and then you find out the big twist, the big the end, which twist. we'll get we'll get to here in a little bit. But yeah, I mean, in in, in the uh, in the second version of what happened to Kamomo, uh, at first uh, she said that you know she hung herself, but in the second one she, she said that her. she that she killed her, that she and strangled her because she just couldn't stand the, her beauty or whatever. No, the reason why was because because uh, she's obsessed with heaven and hell, and, and we learned that. She yeah, that's right. That's she right. gets this obsession because she was raised by a, a priest or something, and yeah, uh, for a, a, yeah. A, or a, was sold to a priest at one point, and that happened in both versions of the story as well. And yeah, th there's a more d there's a darker thing that happens there as well. It's implied that the priest uh, molested her as well. Exactly. Heavily yeah. So implied. it's fucked up. But you know, she gets this obsession with heaven and hell, and so she thinks that her friend Komomo is going to go to hell because she has a friend who is so evil and, and Ooh, has done horrible yeah, yeah. things and, you know, killed her dad and shit. And so, you know, it, what the, re the real reason why she did it was because uh, she wanted her friend to go to heaven. And, and so by betraying her, they weren't friends anymore. It's, it's fucked up, but that's her explanation. It's a weird line of reasoning, honestly. It, it is. It, it doesn't follow, but you got to understand is like this chick is fucked up. Yeah, her she, complete tone shifts at this point, and you realize that this woman's a fucking psychopath. Yeah, you know? she, she plays the unreliable narrator trope to a T, honestly. Yes. Like uh, almost to a Lynchian degree. And practically. at least a third of the movie is flashback told by her, you know? Yeah, and that's where most of the really fucked up, disturbing things happen. Honestly, yeah. Uh, like, of course, I mean, like, let, let's get to the abortion scene. It's like, yeah, oh yeah, they show a uh, straight up old school abortion. Like, I, I remember first time I saw that, I, I was watching it with with uh, Joseph, who was mm -hmm. one of the original members of the show. Like, I, I was watching that with him, and and I was just like, yep, that's an abortion. <laughs> they just go right up there with. Yeah, they just go right up in. She just goes right up in. There's like I, oh, I mean, I, I'd imagine that that's what that would be at that time. I mean, how else would you do that? It's not. That's true. I mean, it wasn't necessarily seen as a medical uh, fall down thing. the stairs. 
Oh, that's messed up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't oh, do that. Come on. No, now. we live in a country where you don't have to do that. We live in a civilization where... Ho- hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully we hopefully. still will. Yeah. Yeah. There is a place at the edge of perception where pain is everywhere and fear is the air you breathe. No, mm-hmm. yeah, you should always practice safe abortions and uh, yeah. you know, get medical help and yeah, De- have definitely. a doctor perform that procedure for you because it is your legal right. Exactly, as a woman. So yeah, we'll, we'll get that. We'll get out that out of the way. But <laughs> yeah, th- there's a straight up abortion in this movie, and I mean, I kind of wonder if that might be one of the things that really kind of tipped the. Uh, Tip the sensors over the line a little bit. You know? I think so. Consider the time. It's 2006. We're not, we're, we're kind of progressive, but we're not as progressive as we are 2006, now. 2006, we're right in the middle of the Bush years right there. We're just this two, is true. We're two years away from the Obama administration by that point, you know? Yeah. We're so, two, two or three years removed. So, you know, yeah, let's think, think about the political climate and consider, you know, the, uh, well, the weird thing about that is, is that there was another Masters of Horror episode that dealt with the the pro-choice, pro-life uh, uh, mm-hmm. debate. There, there was, I think, it was called pro-life. I, I'll say this: I, you know, I, I had mentioned to my family that I was going to go record an episode on this movie, and I told them, you know, I was saying, you know, the same thing I said on the podcast, uh, which was that, you know, it's not like necessarily gory or sexual. It's just disturbing. And there's also aborted fetuses. And <laughs> my dad was kind of like, yeah, like telling me like that, that was like inappropriate to talk about or the table or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, like I don't know. Maybe abor- aborted fetuses are totally inappropriate to talk about, man. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you, maybe doing this uh, podcast is leading you to dark places. Oh I guess Lord. so. I guess I'm I'm spiraling down. I'm an atheist today. I'll be a homosexual tomorrow. Oh no, not I that. smoked the weed once and now I'm a homosexual. Well, that's that's uh, that means that you're a uh, l- 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 liberal. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, these are our stabs at political humor. That, that's what this is why we do not do political podcasts. <laughs> no, but fuck it. Yeah, fuck it, right? But yeah, I mean, the fetuses are very jarring, and I mean, the interesting thing is, is that you know, as the prostitute girl, like she eventually, as she gets older, she helps her mom with the abortions. Mm-hmm. She helps it, and that raises the ire of <laughs> the Splat. local children. Oh yeah, they, <laughs> they they start throwing rocks at her, and she, they, unbeknownst to them, she happens to have a fetus in a bucket, and she drops the bucket. And yeah, splat. It's just every single time they drop the fucking fetus in, in, in the river and, and everything, you know, it's splat. It's, it's, just, it's so great. And, yeah, and then, and then there's just scenes of the Splish. fetus just kind of floating down the river, just, you know. Woo! Yeah, just floating down. <laughs> it's like, wow, that, there, there's some kind of metaphor there. I don't you know. You know, so it's actually <laughs> hilarious almost. Whenever it's, it's, it's terrible. It's sad. But, you know, there's this sense of irony because, you know, you watch the mom go ahead and dump these fetuses. And then you see her with her baby girl that she birthed herself and she just sploosh, just like the, the, the fetuses in yeah. the river. Oh, and you're you're like, what? Just like plop. Just like not even thinking twice about it, and then, and of course you find out why. You, I mean that she's an incest child, so it's like yeah, and not only an incest child, but you know of course look at her face, she's deformed. That's true. When she, they present the story to you to the first time, like the first time that that's that's told to you, uh, we're 
we're not even told that, you know, this isn't the second version of the story, but we're not even told about the incest shit yet. So, you know, it's kind of presented as a, oh, what the fuck? She just like dropped her baby. And then you get a little bit of context as to why. And it's like, okay. So it just, just further demonstrates how unreliable of a narrator she is. Yeah. Uh, the unnamed girl that I, I, she doesn't have a name. I just, I just call her the prostitute girl. <laughs> yeah, the prostitute girl, you know, like uh, played by what, Yoki Kudo? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, yeah, I mean, what happens next, though, I mean, the girl, she ends up killing her lecherous, drunken father who is heavily implied to have assaulted her, mm-hmm. you know. And that that's a pretty jarring scene in his own right like he literally just goes out to take a piss and she just runs up and just bashes his head in and it's like well you know good riddance whatever. you know what good riddance yeah that asshole like yeah. this oh. but it leads to her being sold to that pimp and that just kind of leads to her current predicament so by the but, way yuki kudo is just credited as a woman as woman woman okay so oh man whoa, whoa. man man so so like like uh sorry that's a so, sneak so, peek at our next episode so so like nancy benoit may she rest in peace damn <laughs> yeah I yeah don't know. but yeah i mean then you actually see the reason why she stole the jade ring that mm-hmm. that that led to kimomo's torture allegedly right and what you see is this hand start raising out of the side of her head. And it's this, it's this, it turns out that she's a, a twin. She has a twin. And it's a hand with little eyes and a mouth. And she spits out the jade ring. And it's like she starts talking like Kimomo and everything. And this is where things get hallucinatory. So she is a. Uh Fudakuchi Ona. Yeah, that's right. She's actually a demon, a, a, a folkloric like lo- yokai, right? Fudakuchi Ona. Yeah, what is Fudakuchi Ona? Like what? It what it literally means a, a two mouthed woman. Oh wow. Um, it's a it's a yokai. She, she's a yokai. That's crazy. You know that's crazy because uh, Takashi Miike has done a kids movie called The Great Yokai War, so he he goes that into yo- he goes into yokai folklore there. Yeah. So so he would know a thing or two about that. Man, I wish she was a Funanari Ona. Ooh. That'd be hot. Oh wow. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um I mean I'm not, but I am. <laughs> yeah. Hutakochi hu, sorry, Hutakuchi Ona. Wow. I'm trying to pronounce it, you know, correctly. Yeah, of course. You know, forgive us if we're butchering the uh pronunciation. Oh no, I have it right now. Yeah. I got it right this time. Oh, okay. But not the first time, maybe. Oh, damn it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that that's an interesting uh, turn. And, and it, it turns out, in a way, maybe she was kind of inducing him into this weird dreamlike state where he accidentally kills his girlfriend. I mean, I think that that's what's meant when, uh, sh- when he shoots the girl and mm-hmm. then she turns into Komomo. But yeah, there, I mean, she does shapeshift there, right? Yeah, she shapeshifts into Kamomo, and then Kamomo takes a big old chunk of her brains out, and he's like, I waited for you, Christopher. Yeah, and- <laughs> that was fucking underhanded as fuck. Oh, seriously, it really was, man. And then she just drops down and dies, and then you, you we end the movie with Billy Drago in Japanese prison, and he sees a fetus in a bucket, he sees and a fetus in a bucket of the water or tea or whatever the fuck yeah. it is he's supposed to drink. And then he with starts his slush food. Yeah, and then he starts rocking it. And then you see Kimomo and the little sister, which, by the way, it's heavily implied that he uh, assaulted his little sister. Uh, it's heavily implied he had something to do with her death. I don't know what the specific I think, implications are. I think are. that it's implied that he did something unsavory. It was He was really? doing something unsavory. It's Damn. heavily implied. Damn. Yeah, there's a lot of implications of that sort of thing in this movie. So, yeah, the trigger warning is definitely, uh, the content warning everything is definitely warranted here. So everybody's so, fucked, man. No, it's, it's, all, it's a very fucked movie. It is. There's a reason that this is on disturbing movie lists. I mean, I mean, what else can you really say? Yeah. But how do you think that it stacks up to the other crazy Mike movies that you've seen since you've been on this um, podcast? 
it's hard to say. It's a, it, it feels like a very different thing. I mean, I'm not going to say it's my favorite Mickey game movie I've seen so far, but um, I mean, it, 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 it's got all of this, all of his signature all over it. Um, I mean, I, I think it's probably most like audition, but I haven't seen audition. I just, from what I've heard of it, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I would say that of the ones that I've seen and I've been on, this kind of more is is like Ichi the Killer than it would be like Visitor Q or Gozu. But well, I don't know. It kind of has a little bit of that Gozu quality to it too. It's it's very dreamlike, not unlike Gozu. It's kind of like yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of in between yeah. those two, Ichi the Killer and Gozu. I'd say yeah, but but like I said, it also kind of gets that way in Audition. You know, Audition has a lot of that mind fuckery going on there. So yeah, but I haven't seen Audition, so I can't really say for sure. But for, from what I've heard, that seems to be kind of the closest to this, um, especially considering the subject matter of you know basically torture porn uh, or the, the content, I should say. <laughs> yeah, and it. It's, I mean, it's just as well that we're kind of getting out of his torture porn stuff because there's just so much more to Takashi Miike's work, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it'll be interesting to get into some of his adaptations of anime and video games, you know? Or his, or his Zebra Man, which is his take on the Super Sentai uh, type of, uh, of uh, Fuck show. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, basically that's his Power Rangers Mm-hmm. essentially or or his common writer i should say yeah so i mean i i would love for him to do a kaiju man it would be awesome to have him do a, a godzilla movie that would be awesome that would be based as fuck it would be so amazing <laughs> honestly takashi miike the chad totally like what 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 movie? makes subversive slash disturbing slash what subversive i guess is really the best word yeah uh, uh refuses to elaborate leaves <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like i said how did you think this stands up to the other disturbing movies he's made so far um just, just kind, kind of just in your approximation oof that's a hard one i don't know i don't know if i have really have a a, a way to quantify that or, or would, categorize that i would say that you know it's definitely not as out there as ichi the killer you know yeah. but it's it's a lot more understated than even audition, okay. you know, which is itself a very slow burn understated work, you know, because this has a slow burn quality to it as well. I mean, I, I kind of feel like that if he didn't have the constraint of a 45 minute to an hour long episode, like this could easily have been the length of Gozu, honestly. And yeah. I, I feel like we could have had a lot, a lot of other things elaborated on here a little bit. Yeah, it's not very long, so it's kind of like we're 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 almost struggling to even talk about it. For <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very very super condensed work, but there is a, there is a lot to say. It's just you kind of just have to watch it. It's it's a very it's a, it's a fever dream thing. It's a it's a you just kind of have to witness it. It's not going to take up very much of your time. Again, you know, I feel like this goes without saying at this point with any of Takashi Miike's more disturbing works, but yeah, not uh, to- you, it's not for everyone. No, it really isn't. I mean, there's some people that might even get a little bored by it, you know, at least until the more, you know, notor the more notorious scenes. You well, know? I, I'm going to say it's not for everyone just, you know, just based on the content matter. I mean, because like I said, that goes without saying. That's yeah, that goes without saying. But just just even Takashi Miike's works in and of themselves, they kind of have this uh, quality to them that, you know, they're, you're either going to really love them or you're just going to not get them. You know? Yeah. And, and what's funny is watching some reviews of this, which are actually kind of hard to find. This far, far and few between. And this is not as, you know, not one of his more well known works or, yeah, or we well actually, covered works. We actually found more reviews from like smaller YouTube channels that have barely like any views or whatever. And, you know, barely, even barely even production values to them. And, and from but, what I've seen, you know, uh, people that are into this sort of thing that, because I watch several on my own too, uh, that are that are have uh, that are into disturbing cinema are, are going to appreciate the the art. But people who are not into that, you know, yeah. it's like there's not a lot to say, and it's like I can't you can't complain about it because it does what it does very well and extremely effectively. It's just 
maybe that's not your cup of tea and that's okay. Now for me, you know, I'm getting into this stuff. I, I like to see the, uh, the extremities of cinema. I think yeah. it's fascinating. The thing is, this is a, this is even still kind of mainstream compared to some of the other stuff I have here, man. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I have where the dead go to die. Like that movie will, <laughs> it's not a good movie, but it will fuck with you. It's, but it's, it's an interesting movie because Jimmy screamer claws, he, uh, he actually made another movie that is a little a little less graphic but just as dark mm-hmm. but it, it's something to look up anyways but I, yeah. I have stuff like that but I mean this right here this barely you know rankles my you know disturbometer or whatever it, it barely qualifies to me like I, I'm just I don't know maybe I'm just getting jaded like that but <laughs> it's it, I don't know I mean it, it, it's it's pretty disturbing. I mean, the, the, the torture stuff will, will get you, I think, if nothing else will. Because, I, I mean, like like I said, we're not perturbed by fetuses or anything like that. But uh, the, the, I'm, I'm kind of squeamish with, with the torture. I mean, maybe you're not because you've been maybe desensitized to it. You've seen more of it than I have. But it yeah. still gets me. And, like, the gore doesn't get me anymore. But, but the torture stuff still does. Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, I remember when we had martyrs on on that one time. It's like, yeah, that was fucking fun, right? That one bothered. That one bugged me too. Yeah, you know, Itchy the Killer to me was just hilarious. Yeah, that that's well, that's just a fucking cartoon, you know. You practically. know. Well, what about Visitor Q? <laughs> Visitor Q to, was also hilarious. Yeah, that's a hilarious. It's a funny movie. It I, really I'm, is. I'm uh, that well, that is actually a black comedy, so it's meant to be funny, but. You know, and then that's the way that I see it. This kind of, you know, it it, it 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 has that horror quality to it. It's a horror movie. It is, yeah, it's unabashedly a horror movie. Wait, definitely. we the only other because see, Ichi the Killer is not horror, is it? It's horror adjacent. It's horror. It's like horror action. Yeah, it's it's like action horror with some comedy thrown in, and it's a Yakuza movie. The Yakuza movie that kind of says yeah. it all, right? I, I would say Gozu is more of a horror movie than okay. The Gozu was a horror movie. That's what eh, thriller. It's a horror thriller with okay. uh, dreamlike elements. Okay, you know, audition. It's audition doesn't start off as horror. It just kind of becomes horror. <laughs> it just det- it just descends into just a nightmare. But this is straight up horror. You know, Masters of Horror, it, it goes for uh, the jump scares. It goes for uh, creating that uh, that atmosphere and just just leaving you perturbed. You know, <laughs> oh, you know what? I just I just figured out, you know, You're like, what, wow, that was that was a thing. You know, you know what Takashi Miike needs to make a uh, remake of oh. Flowers of Flesh and Blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have this movie. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, man. I mean, I let's go ahead and give some of our final thoughts on this movie. I mean, like I said, it's not a long movie, so there's not a whole lot to talk about. We've pretty much gone through like the meat and potatoes of this movie and yeah. of you know Masters of Horror. And it's kind of hard to talk about a 45 minute movie in more than in, in more than 45 minutes. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, so Ash, go ahead and give give your final thoughts on Takashi Miike's imprint. Um, it's, it, you know, watching it, I think the first thing that I thought was, wow, that's a thing. Uh, I enjoyed <laughs> it. I mean, I, I thought it was, I thought it was cool. Like I said, the, the best word I can use to describe Miike is subversive because no matter what you're watching, it's going to, it's going to subvert expectations in one way or another. And, and this movie does that definitely, uh, as a disturbing film and just tonally. So, you know, it, it, and I'm glad that we, you know, we're kind of getting this sort of out of our wheelhouse of, you know, this is kind of a, a kind of a perfect note to end on on our like disturbing movie lists. Yeah. With with uh, Takashi Miike, anyway. I mean, unless there's something else that you feel like really needs to be talked about in within the next well, few seasons. The one movie that I would talk about that I wouldn't say is disturbing, but it's just really, 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 really out there would be Happiness of the Katakuris. Oh, we haven't done As the Gods Will yet. As the Gods Will is an interesting one. That's Although interesting. That, that, that's more of a uh, movie that kind of followed a trend that you saw in a lot of anime and manga, you know, the game. And even yeah. in movies like the game theory-based kind of action horror movies, you know, I, I, it kind of started with, like, Cube, 
and, and kind of boiled up from there. <laughs> I need to I need to see a movie that's basically like a game theory like like type movie like that like horror movie, but like Matt Pat is behind it all. He's the actual mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that would be hilarious. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't give Matt Pat any ideas. <laughs> I mean, he has enough. He has enough on his hand with FNAF. Because apparently that's all he does is FNAF. Is, is that all he does? I don't know. I, I, I used practically. to. I, I enjoyed some of his stuff before. I don't think I've tuned in in a while. But. I don't know. He, he's he's kind of getting a reputation for some kind of going and talking about the same shit. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we still we still think Matt Pat is cool, though. I mean, he's just, you know, just, you know, m- move on, man. Move on, bro. Move on. But anyway, my final thoughts on Takashi Miike's imprint. As I said, as far as a disturbing work, it's barely a blip on the radar. Like I, I find, honestly, some of the shit on uh, fucking audition in the final fifteen minutes of audition to be crazier than this, to tell the truth. And and that that is even and that's just maybe only a little bloodier and gorier than this. Like yeah. not by much, but. What I will say is that I do like the story here. I, I do like how, you know, the prostitute girl, she's the narrative device. And she's the one that kind of puts everything, like, in its context and puts it in motion, you know. And, and then and then just being that unreliable narrator halfway through, it's like... And, and in, in a way, it almost feels like it's this dialogue between audience and director, kind of. You know, yeah. it feels like, you know, you have uh, the prostitute girl as Mike and he's like kind of weaving this kind of tapestry for you. And you're the one is is just like you're, you're keeping something something from me. This doesn't make <laughs> sense. Like what, what is really going on here? You know, I mean, I, I kind of think that that might be the actual main theme of this kind of it's okay. it, it's it's more of a uh, narrative about, you know, the director and the audience kind of. And there, there's lots of movies that do that, but it's interesting how Mike really kind of used the characters as the framework for that, mm-hmm. you know, and and, and uh, as the framework for the narrative itself as well. I mean, you do. I mean, technically, you're, what we're getting is a ton of exposition about what happened. Honestly. We are. And a lot of it is not even truthful exposition. <laughs> Half of it. No, not at all. She, yeah. She's bullshitting him most of the time. You kind of wonder how much of the final product seems real. I mean, at that point, it seems so fucked up. It has to be true. But who the fuck knows, man? Yeah, The seriously. only thing we can go off of are the things that are consistent between the two stories. And that's just one way of measuring that. Yeah. Then, this movie, you know, is, is ambiguous as fuck. You know, I, and, and you're never really quite sure what is going and, on. And then knowing that she is a yokai woman anyways, it's like how much of that is even real, period. That's true. I mean, what is actually real there? Good point. So, I mean, it, it, it kind of just puts everything in the narrative in, uh, in question, really. Yeah. I mean, hell, how do we even know that Billy Drago is really at the, uh, at the brothel this entire time, you know? Is he really at the brothel? I don't know. Are we, are we at the brothel, bro? I don't know. Maybe we are. It's like, and, 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 may, and maybe the, 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 the little person with the syphilis, that's just his own syphilis. Maybe that's why he went crazy. I think we got to record a collateral cinema episode in a brothel. Wow. I, I don't know. Where would we find a brothel to do that? Uh, go, to, go to Nevada? Yeah. Let's oh. go to Nevada. And oh, you know shit. what's funny? We're not even, we're not even going to have sex with them. We're, we're just going to record an episode with them. <laughs> we'll just have get them, a like, couple of call girls to record an episode. <laughs> oh, I'm sure Robert will be like, "Fuck that! I'm paying. I'm paying good money here." <laughs> Shit. I mean, once I once we've recorded the episode, sure. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> y'all motherfuckers can have your fun. So yeah, but yeah, I say that you know, as far as you know, Mickey's extreme works, it's not that big of a deal. But as far as you know, his, his, his as narrative is concerned, I say that it's pretty much almost up there with something like audition, yeah. narratively speaking, and and also the the visuals are, is are they're very striking. You see lots of reds, and then it's kind of juxtaposed with the blue hair of the prostitute girl. You know, 
And, and then you have Billy Drago. He's just kind of a figure in black almost. So, I mean, you, you almost kind of see what roles they're playing just based on what they're dressed as. That's a good point. Yeah, the you colors know? in this movie are something we, we didn't even really touch on. But, uh, you know, just, just like you mentioned early on, all the prostitutes are in red. What's up with that? Yeah, all the prostitutes are in red. And then, you know, the... Besides homegirl. Besides homegirl. And she, yeah, she's... And th- I think that's what really implies the otherworldliness of that character, you know, is like, I mean, do you really see uh, anyone other than the headmistress, you know, interact with her that much? No. Other than Komomo? No. Maybe she you know, maybe she was purposely, you know, showing herself to Komomo and to the headmistress. Yeah, I don't know. You know, maybe she maybe they were the only two that were aware of her. That's a good point. We don't even know. Yeah, we don't even really know anything. So, I mean, in a way, this almost becomes almost a Gozu level mindfuck. When, the, the, uh, like I said earlier, if he probably would have had more time, he probably could have constructed something like that with this story easily. See, Gozu also did ended up being funny. Yo, it's very funny. <laughs> That's a this comedy. Is, in its this own one point. is not funny. <laughs> no, there's there's nothing funny about this at all. There there's no comedy here. So then, then that's that's where its parallels lie lie with audition. Yeah, that's, that's audition the other is a, film that we've done that's actually serious. That's a very very serious movie that has something to say about you know the way Japanese culture approaches uh, gender roles and uh, relationships in general. But you know, and, and and this one is you know kind of kind of like that a lot. So I I say you know it's definitely worth. It, it, it's worth checking out if you absolutely need to own it. You can find it very easily. I mean, I, I think that it's not even that expensive. I maybe, I maybe spent like seven bucks on this mm-hmm. DVD when I, when I bought it. So I don't know. I, I don't know if it's that desired right now that it would go up in price. But I mean, just just look for it. And also, I mean, you can find it on Tubi for free. It's free on Tubi. Yeah. You can you can check it out there. So. I mean, definitely check it out. I mean, especially since it was banned. I mean, it has that aura over it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I say go for it here. Fuck it yeah. Just, you know, don't expect one of Mickey's greatest movies. You know, just expect a pretty good episode of Masters of Horror done by Takashi Miike. Yeah, even so, like, I think it's I think it's a must-watch out of, you know, Miike's 100-plus director credit movies yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and i can't wait to start getting into the, his other works i mean you know especially when we get to bird people of china that one is a very very interesting very almost laid back contemplative piece it's more of a mm. philosophical movie you know yeah so but yeah i guess that that brings our review and analysis of imprint and it brings our it brings our mikaversary episode to an end hell yeah yeah so let's talk a little more about that we are now well over 5000 followers on twitter mm-hmm. we're fast approaching 4000 followers on instagram and we are about to hit 10,000 downloads. 10,000 downloads. Across God all damn, platforms. Man. All across all platforms. It's, it's it's crazy, man. Like, we've been doing this for close to five years now. It's like, I mean, yeah, there's some other podcasts that, you know, if, I mean, they, they, they probably, you know, got more downloads earlier and everything. But, you know, I feel like we have really fought for every download you know? i think we have man i think that consistently you know we've we've we, we've always been about it we've always done our gotten our shit out you know it, sometimes stuff's got delayed but it, yeah you know we've always managed to to continue to put content out and yeah and yeah. And, and so we want to thank all of everybody who listens to us because we wouldn't keep going if we weren't um noticing you know that <laughs> that things are progressing so we've got you to thank for that and and also we have the podcast and the potter and family to thank for that as well we we are thankful for everyone who has uh been on the show since we've been on we are thankful for uh the uh we're, we're thankful for all the podcasts that follow us on twitter you know, which that that's something I've noticed. It's like, I mean, I go looking for, looking uh, for podcasts on Twitter. It's like, oh wow, when did the when did they start following us? It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm finding stuff like that. You know, 
So, I mean, definitely follow us on Twitter and follow us on Instagram and definitely listen to our back catalog. We have a lot of really interesting episodes with lots of different people, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we, we've had quite a few guests hosts on our on our podcasts. Yeah, you know? yeah, actually, we have. So, yeah, check out our back catalog. Like, I mean, check out our episodes on The Room on and Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero. Like, we have a lot of content there. You know, our Neil Breen content, you know, we're doing more of that. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of went through everything that was Tommy Wiseau-related, and so now, you know, Neil Breen's kind of what we're moving into, and it, it's something that we can expect to see every season from here on but you know we also do a takashi Miike episode every season obviously yeah. so check out our back catalog of all that i think we have pretty much named every episode we've done so far yeah d- definitely you know definitely check that out and of course we're going to continue the tradition of our 420 episode we're just going to release this uh, after the uh after the season is done and, and another little note, I mean, we're probably going to get the Cowboy Bebop episode out probably after the season. I mean, I don't know. We're just kind of still yeah. kind of getting things together with uh, the Retro Anime podcast uh, right now. The way things are going, it's likely the season's going to actually end in May. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, we're, we're going to go ahead and record a bunch of episodes these next couple of weeks. So All we're right, going to go ahead and just so. kind of kind of let, let's just go ahead and just kind of get get them all done. You yeah, know? that's fair. Well, fuck it, you know. But but anyways, yeah, I mean, follow us there. I mean, you can find... I mean, and also, you know, we are going to do more Patreon content here. I mean, as soon as the season is over with, I think we need to start doing more content there. I agree, yeah. Definitely. But, uh, yeah, Collateral Cinema, five <laughs> years. Damn. It's what like, a feat, man. That, yeah, that's crazy, man. It's crazy to think. I mean, I wish we had Robert here. I, mean, I know. It's weird doing an anniversary episode without Robert. I know, man. It's so weird. It's like, Robert, c- come on, man. Come back home, dude. <laughs> come home to Collateral Cinema, man. You know, we know that you're listening. <laughs> mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, it's like definitely look for us on Patreon and everything. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about Collateral Gaming. What do you have planned for Collateral Gaming? Uh, well, we are, okay, well, we just got out our episode on Elden Ring. Go check that out, because that was actually kind of late as well, but at least we got it within a month-ish of the game coming out, and it's still being talked about, so I'm really happy to, that we got that done. Uh, this next month, we're going to be doing our bad game review on Anthem, and then our 420 special on, uh on GoldenEye, on original hardware. <laughs> That's awesome. I keep mentioning that because I'm excited, man. I'm excited to get really stoned and just play on Robert's Nintendo 64 that's just chilling here. Yeah, seriously. Robert's here in spirit. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to find a way to get an actual CRT TV that works for that, you know? <laughs> this one right here that I have, I don't know. I couldn't get it to work. I, I tried. I tried to hook it up to different uh, converters and whatnot. It just doesn't work. You tried some... hooking it up directly to the Nintendo 64? I did. Of course. Damn. That was the first thing that I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, I, I can't wait for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Like, I'm definitely going to be down to play some GoldenEye. That'll be a lot of fun if you want me to play. We're also, yeah, no, that's that's the plan. Because yeah. I don't have any of my collateral gaming co-hosts yeah. that, are, that still smoke with me. So, yeah, um, definitely. yeah I want you and Robert on that episode. And uh, we're also going to be doing a collaboration episode on Sonic the Hedgehog 2. I mean, it makes sense because uh, we did Sonic the Hedgehog 1. So it's just natural. That's coming out, you know, early this month. And this time we're going to actually go to the theater to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, when, when that came out, that was at the advent of the pandemic. So, I mean, that it's, it's kind of crazy. It know? is crazy how far we've come. Uh, I'll have to watch the first one again, I think, in, like, good quality again. And, uh, and then we'll watch that. Maybe possibly a Sonic the Hedgehog 2 video game episode as well. Oh, that'll be fun. I love Sonic. I still but haven't beaten that damn game. All these also, years. Uh, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga uh, as, a, as a game launch spoiler-free review. Fun. So, because oh, yeah. that just came out, I pre-ordered it. So we're gonna talk about it, or Man. I'm gonna talk about it if I have to. Wow, it's yeah, it's crazy. They're getting into the final three movies, huh? 
Damn. Uh, it, it's Sky gonna Walker be saga. It covers all nine movies. Oh, it's gonna go through all nine movies, huh? Yeah. So oh. they redid all the levels from the ground up for all of the previous. It's a oh, brand new game no covering way. all nine movies. That's why it's the Skywalker Saga. I I, I want to play that. That sounds like a lot of fun, man. Yeah, I've got oh, it. Yeah. It's pre. It's already preloaded on my Switch. I'm just waiting for it to come out. <laughs> oh man, that's so awesome! Hell yeah, yeah for I, real. I'd, I'd like to sit down and play that. That sounds fun. But anyway, yeah, that's what's going on with uh, Collateral Gaming. And for Collateral Cinema, our next episode is going to be So I Married an Axe Murderer. We're starting to get into the final few episodes of the season now. Uh, after that, we're going to do Sidekicks, and then it's going to be Rocky Two, And then that's the season. Uh, plus our 420 special. For, plus our 420 special. On of Evil Bong. Evil Bong. Oh, yeah. Going back to Full Moon Features. That's going to be a lot of fun. So Man. that yeah, 420 special that's gonna be coming out this month, uh, on 420. Yeah, I believe that we should be having somebody uh, joining us for that episode. I believe. Okay. Yeah, I, I think maybe St. Paul Filmcast and our friend Megan, who was on the, uh, she she was on the uh, Princess Bride episode, right? Yeah, she's gonna be on our So I Married an Axe Murderer. So I Married an Axe Murderer. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I'm really excited to have her on there. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, that's what's going to be coming up with Collateral Cinema. And we'll probably get a director's cut out somewhere along the line as well. Mm-hmm. That'll, that'll be a lot of fun. I'm going to get with Robert on something. You know, we may have to we may have to go ahead and do a Leprechaun 3 and Jason Takes Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You know, because, I mean, you know, you got slashers in the city there. So slashers yeah. in the city. Hell yeah. So anyway, you can find Collateral Cinema and Collateral Gaming on uh, Spotify, on YouTube. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Google. We're on pretty much anywhere you can get your podcast. iHeartRadio, Chill Lover Radio, uh, all those places and everything. And like I said earlier, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check us out there. And same with uh, Collateral Gaming, right? Right. All of the above. Yep, and and of course we mentioned Patreon earlier. So yeah, check us out there. We got one dollar and five dollar levels there, and full length commentaries. Fuck yeah, yeah. And if you want uh, some uh, free examples of those commentaries, check out some of our director's cut commentaries. We've done Ninja Scroll. We've done Demon City Shinjuku. We've done Second Glance. I think we need to do uh, the Pretender next. That's going to be a lot of fun. Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess uh, we don't have anything else to add. Like, maybe, you know, Texas Sundown, of course. We're going to get back to filming that very soon. Yeah, we'll just wait for Robert to... Yeah, wait for Robert to kind of... I can't, I won't, I, I can't, want to. I won't. <laughs> uh, we, we love you, Robert, man. It's like, <laughs> come, back to, come back to the show, Robert. Come back to the show. But, yeah, thank you once again for these last five years of podcasting. We love you all. Uh, thank you for listening to Collateral Cinema. I mean, we'll see you at 10,000 downloads. Uh, see you y'all later, and glory to Ukraine. Slav Ukraina. Hell yeah. Cinema is a collateral media podcast. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.